Good afternoon, everybody. We're back for another session, and thank you for uh, following us as we go on this journey. Uh, last time we had gone over looking at what the sustainable chemis chemicals are and how to start looking at the analysis in terms of building materials and building processes. And we left it open that uh, this session would be more focused on helping you understand what we mean when we say chemical processes in building materials, their function, what you should look for, what you should pay attention to. And so this session will dive a little deeper into the chemistry, but we're also cognizant that not everybody with us is uh, a chemist, so we'll uh, keep it at a high level. Uh, and those of you who are chemists can always uh, contact us and get more information and details on what we're discussing. And with that, I turn it over to Hezra uh, for the today's session. Thank you, Hezra. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, we, we, this is the second part of, of, of the talk on sustainable chemicals in building uh, material processes. Um, and today, specifically, you're covering uh, um, cost recovery. Uh, as you can see, the first webinar uh, was done on 18th. We were supposed to do this on, on 25th, which failed. And so we are um, having it on today, uh, as you can see. So uh, in terms of the, today's uh, talk, we just need to do um, a small recap uh, on, um, on, on some of the things that we, we had mentioned. Uh, that is on what sustainability um, um, and what sustainable materials how they interact with the building uh, building materials and the chemicals that are associated with it. Then we're going to look at life, life cycle cost recovery. Then we are going to uh, get into the energy and resource savings, uh, waste reductions, increased property value, government incentives, and of course, uh, conclusion. Now, when we talk about sustainability or sustain, uh, sustainable uh, building, we are basically talking about three pillars of sustainability. That is the uh, social um, environment. We are talking about the, the social um, uh, aspect uh, of, of, uh, of sustainability. We are talking about the environmental aspect of sustainability and we're talking about the economic um, uh, pillar of sustainability. So whereby when you have environmental and economic you basically have what we call the uh, viable, is the project viable in a sense. Um, then when you have environment and social, you have uh, what you're looking at for, is it bearable if, if the two uh, are, 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 are in confluence? Then you have uh, social and economic, when we, where we're talking about now equitable, uh, equitable uh, equitability of, of 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 the project or of the of the of, of the system, and then so when you mix all these things together, then that's when you get what we call sustainable. So when you look at sustainable, and then we delve into building materials. So what is sustainable building, or what is what do you mean by sustainable uh, building in a nutshell? What we see is that when we talk about sustainable building, we're talking about a certain efficiency that are accrued, accrued uh, when, when you're talking about a building is in itself. So you are talking about energy um, efficiency of, of the entire building. You're talking about um, energy generation and dis distribution efficiency. You are talking about indoor environment improvement. You're talking about reduction of greenhouse gases. You're talking about material efficiency. You're talking about uh, resource efficiency. You're talking about design efficiency, management efficiency, um, waste management efficiency, comfort efficiency, water efficiency, and land efficiency. So that when you talk about sustainable building, which is the, the main um, uh, gist of the topic, which is the sustainable building. And so we have sustainable chemicals in building materials. So sustainability building talk about these various factors or various efficiency that, that we are dealing with. And so we see that in that nutshell, we see that there's different chemicals, there's different emissions that um, are come into bear. And these emissions, this, these are all chemicals that we're talking about, um, which uh, come into place, different solvents uh, used um, 
from let me say construction from land um, um, land preparation, um, the building itself, processes itself, the lifetime of the of the building and the different repairs, the demolition, all these things um, do generate certain chemicals. And so that's what we are looking at. And when you're looking at for different solvents used in admixtures versus refurbishment and op operations, then we have the integrated environmental management, uh, inter integrated environment management, uh, which requires the uh, um, use of sustainable development and then uh, life cycle analysis, of course. And of course, you can see the, the, the different um, sources of where we're getting this information. Now, when we are talking about uh, the building process, there are different chemicals that we are talking about. For example, the one that I've shown there, that is an example of a process in chemical building, whereby we just talk about the curing process only. We're not talking about the laying of the concrete, we're just talking about the curing itself. Now, if you talk about curing, you see that there's different um, things that are, 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 are there's different ways in which you can do curing. That is, you have the ponding, you have the wet curing, you have the sealing, you have the chemical curing, you have the membrane curing, you have the, um, the um, steam uh, curing. And, and so you can see just from a simple process itself, there's different aspects that we that come into in, into into effect but if you look at uh, uh, detail into those different processes what you notice is that all those are different chemical processes that are taking place so you see that there is there's going to be a uh, different processes different chemical processes that are in, ingrained in the building process itself so we say that for example co co concrete curing which is uh, helps to prevent the loss of moisture content from the concrete so concrete is probably cured uh, what we see is that these are different chemicals. For example, we, we talk about synthetic resins compound, such as acrylic compounds. I'll, 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 for those who are not chemists, I'll, be, I'll, I'll try and explain uh, what these things are about. Then you have wax compounds and chlorine rubber compounds, which are, uh, are used. So when we're talking about the different chemicals that are used, we are talking about those kind of chemicals. But then when you talk about sustaining chemicals, we're talking about their alternatives, which can be used in place. So we talk about things like fly ash, we talk about linseed oil based. We talk about waste, um, water based uh, curing process, which are used in place of what is um, currently being used in the in the market. So, when you're talking about the entire process, now you look at these different. These are the different um, areas in which uh, chemical process do occur. We have the uh, concrete admixtures. I'll, I'll I'll break that one down. We have the waterproofing. Uh, we have the joint sealants. We have concrete repair. We have tiling, we have flooring, we have grout and anchor, we have the um, surface uh, uh, treatment. Now, when you're talking about these processes, um, for those who are builders, they understand what this is. But if you're a chemist or you are, you are, you are somebody new to building, they are, they, are, they are strange. But let me just bring it back into in terms of um, the, 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 the aspects of which we, of the chemistry, which is the chemicals they're talking about. For example, if you talk about the concrete admixture, so we are talking about um, natural or manufactured chemicals that are, are added to the concrete uh, before or during the mixing, mixing okay? They are normally um, uh, used to reduce the, uh, limit, reduce the limitation of cement hydration um, with examples such as um, uh, uh, super plasticizers. We have things like um, um, uh, fire retardants, uh, we have uh, accelerators, we, are, we have uh, the shrink preventers so that um, uh, we are able to um, maintain the, the concrete um, concrete um, framework or st strength or the, the capacity that the concrete has had. Then when you talk about waterproofing, we have the different um, chemicals that are added so that there's no seepage of water, either from underground or from whichever aspect into the, the building. So we have chemicals which are, are, are used uh, for, uh, for, for, for this particular uh, process uh, by itself. Then of course, we have things like um, joint filaments, which in case there's, uh, there's uh, areas in which there's uh, places where there's, uh, there's problems whereby the, the, um, the concrete did not mix co correctly, or there's wear and tear of the concrete on itself. So you actually have to be able to use joint uh, sealants, which are basically um, grout and epoxy resins, which I'll, 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 I'll explain. Then you have the concrete repair, which of course we know, for example, this old building which are being repaired. And so when you're using that, you have to use um, this uh, grout. Grout is just basically a mixture 
um, which is sort of uh, viscous that you can actually use to be able to repair or to be able to, uh, to, to mix co uh, concrete together. They come in different uh, variety. So you can have, for example, um, cementitious grout. You can have um, sanded grout, uh, which, is, uh, which is basically the one that we know most, is, which is basically uh, Portland cement, uh, sand, and other additives. Then you have um, unsanded grout, um, which is basically for the, for the wall that you normally uh, see. We have the latex modified grout, which, which is made from the latex material. We have the chemical ground, grout, which are basically mansions. Um, uh, which are more of li li liquid sort of. Then we have acrylic grout, we have uh, Fourier grout. Uh, these are these are um, basic chemi um, chemical um, chemist ch uh, chemicals that are, are added into the mixtures so that they can be able to um, to be repaired. Now when you talk about uh, things like um, uh, joint sealants uh, and and what we are talking about, the, 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 the most of them are actually actually polymers, which are used for purposes of strengthening the capacity of those different um, concrete. So these chemicals, uh, I just wanted to have, um, basically show you a little bit of this chemical so that at least at a certain point, uh, you are also introduced into a small bit of chemistry. You are also, you can increase your knowledge of chemistry a bit. So when you're talking about um, things like um, uh, acrylate, we are talking about basically polymethyl acrylate which um, which is used uh, for for example for um, um, uh, the polyacrylate are, are most commonly waterproofing material um, polyesters also used as waterproofing material but basically the chemical structure is basically uh, something like this and so what you see is that this is uh, polymethyl micral micral uh, metal metal micrylate okay so Per ton of it goes for about uh, 1,509 uh, US dollars per ton. Then you have the epoxy uh, epoxy uh, resin, which is basically poly um, uh, poly epichlorohydrin. Now, they, most of the epoxies have got this particular structure. You see this the the the, the basically the the, um, the the triangle oxide. This is two carbon. Um, two carbons basically binding to one oxygen in the center, in the center so that there's a vinyl group here, you have an oxygen. So then you have that epoxy group. So when these bonds break up, it forms the different polymers. Then of course you have the polyurethane, which can be used as waterproof. You can, you've seen them, those ones in hospitals, floor, um, where they, they use them. It is actually one of the best and very, very expensive uh, um, waterproofing material. It is considered as one of the most res resilient and flexible um, protective, um, protective, uh, protective uh, coating, poly, uh, poly uh, coating, basically. Um, then we have bitumen, uh, bitumen, which is basically the the asphalt, which you've seen in some buildings. They actually pour them on top of of that. Asphalt is basically the the, the spent uh, oil that is from once you've done all the refinement product, the, the, that last bit of it, the, that's the bitumen, which sometimes we on the road, so you can actually use it for 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 building. Then, of course, polymethyl acrylate, which is also known as uh, this one here, which is known. You know it because it's, you've seen it a lot. The the, the um, uh, flexi flexiglass uh, one, which is used um, uh, also for waterproofing. Then, of course, we have the um, John sealants, which can use things like the furan. Furan is basically this one. Here. It's more like um um. Uh, a, a pyrrole system. It's basically five sided with oxygen. You can have furan, you can have thiophene, you can have um, the, 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 the pyrrole itself, which is a nitrogen, which is from the, uh, the pyridine sort of um, systems. Okay. And you can see that just um, a ton of it goes for about 1,500. The polyurea goes for about polyurea and polyurethane are sort of uh, the basic material is actually poly polyurea, which goes for about 6,278 uh, uh, per ton. And then we have the polyethylene, um, poly polyethylene basically, which goes for about 1,327 uh, um, and 39 cents uh, per dollar. Then, so examples of other processes, we have the polymer bonding agents, which uses as bonding agents with concrete and cement based product in interior or exterior application, increase the tensile strength, uh, uh, flexure and bonding strength, and improves in resistance to 
penetrate by torrents and the icing salts. So traditional chemicals used are aqueous emulsions or polymers, as you can see on top there. Uh, then, of course, uh, sustainable chemicals can be used are actually ground granulates plus furnace slag. This is the, the product from once you've done uh, the blast furnace basically used to um, to uh, to heat up or to um, refine metals. So that waste that you actually get from there, you can actually use it as a, as a what? Because they are actually reduced oxides that you can actually use as, as binding agents in, in, in place of some of these very, very expensive chemicals you can see there. So when you're talking about sustainable material, what we are saying basically, uh, uh, sustainable material and processes are becoming increasingly popular, right? Uh, due to their benefits uh, to the environment. Construction chemical play important roles in construction projects, uh, be it in uh, be it, uh, industrial process, uh, projects, the re residential building projects, commercial building projects, and so on. Chemicals are often used in various elements of projects in order to achieve various important qualities such as workability, durability, aesthetics. These are parameters that we are respecting, waterproofing, um, um, basically to increase the value of of the of the project, then you have cost recovery. Um, uh, so, sorry, the initial cost of using sustainable material is often very very high, and 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 that is part of the reason why we are now actually talking about sustainable materials and cost recovery. Because if um, some of the materials are not very very they're not very um, common, I say. Uh, so being able to change this material, being able to transport them, being able to put them in place so that you can actually be able to construct these materials, um, um, you, you accrue some, uh, quite a, a huge bill on, 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 on the proprietor end. So we're not talking about cost recovery in, um, in, in, some, in use of this sustainable material, uh, sustainable chemical in building material and process can be achieved through various strategies that include focus on the cost and financial benefits of green buildings, um, then you have life cycle assessment or green building initiative. We're not talking about uh, these processes um, in terms of the various advantages, financial costs. Uh, you can actually do a cost um, comparison by you, by yourself and basically break them down, and so you're able to be able to pinpoint and say, okay, this is where I'm recovering my cost from one movement to the next. Then life cycle assessment is what we're basically going to um, focus on moving forward. Then we have the green building uh, rating system, which uh, which basically talks about um, uh, is, is which building has got um, better green initiatives on it. Uh, one of the one which is known is called the LEED, which is the uh, leadership in energy and environment design, which basically sort of like gives stickers or uh, um, sort of ranks buildings based on uh, on energy efficiency models. And that, that's the one which is known, particularly it is US. Most of these green, um, green building um, um, certifications are actually country-based. So you, you you cannot be able to, um, to be able to ascertain which one is which on for whichever process. So the one that is actually much more uh, endearing to us and we can actually be able to talk about is actually the life cycle assessment. So when you talk about life cycle assessment, we are Hezron, talking about- Hezron, uh, when we're having trouble with, now it came back. Thank you, the, the screen, yeah. Oh, the screen was disappearing. Okay, so uh, we're not talking about life cycle cost analysis, we're talking about the entire cost associated with the, with the, with the whole system. So uh, life cycle cost analysis, LCCA, is a method that considers the entire life cycle of a building, including the initial cost, the operating cost, and end of life uh, cost. So that means that you're talking about uh, recycling, site preparation, uh, material production, transport, construction, operations, refurbishment, uh, demolition and basically uh, the recycling of that system. So you have to be able to know what, what are the different aspects of there. But in each of this one, you find that there's, um, uh, there's different emissions and chemicals that are being produced by each um, area. And so when you're doing um, cost benefit analysis or cost um, analysis, you have to be um, have that in mind so that um, the, all these materials are all are, are, can be all be used up. For example, the emissions, other material demolition, waste residue from waste treatment, metallurgy industry, those are the products, the waste metals and all of you, how are you going to handle them? So 
when you're looking at uh, in terms of uh, cost analysis in terms of um, chemicals, uh, for example, let's talk about just the, within the building life. We are talking about things like mold, just releasing agents, uh, which prevent other materials from bonding to the surface. This is the mold, so that they cannot prevent that chemical itself. You can see that the traditional chemical uses are core solvents, which are basically volatile organic compounds, and you know that CO two is actually um, um, uh, one of the volatile organic compounds. But you see that the, the in terms of cost uh, permutation, it you use about six hundred US dollars to reduce a ton of CO2 from that, um, uh, from the whatever you are using. But if you are using uh, uh, sustainable chemicals, you can be using things like vegetable oil, mineral oils, cooking oil, cooking spray, or petroleum gels, which also do the same. They actually protect the building from what? From production of, 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 of this mold. We have foam releasing agents, which facilitate stripping of framework, homework, but also render concrete surfaces smooth and health enhance lifespan of the, of the foam. The, the traditional chemicals used are basically oil-based resins, um, water-based resins, uh, organic uh, chemicals-based resins, and the cost associated is about 2,980 to about uh, 3,200 per ton, uh, that is USD. Whereas if you use sustainable chemical, that is oil-based, oil in water immersion, uh, you are most likely going to spend about 900 to about 1,000 per ton. And you can say just by doing that, just a simple analysis, you can see that you are saving a lot by just using chemical. Uh, then last, we have the foam sealers, which is applied along the joints or from to render it leak-proof. When you're building your house, you, you tend to use these foam sealers. Um, um, uh, the easier and better options than the motor. You see that, uh, for example, the, the, the normal one used are things like all little things. It goes to about 6,278 uh, uh, per metric ton. Uh, that, that's the, the cost per, per that's the cost per ton of uh, such kind of uh, thing. This this one I think we talked about for little thing we had mentioned it, it goes for about that six thousand two hundred and seventy eight from my initial chemical that we had, we, had, we, had, we had shown. But you cannot also use vegetable oil esters or oil which at about nineteen and five nineteen and five percent purity, and you can go and it can cost as low as forty dollars. The approximate cost that I showed there is actually from, you can actually import that in Vietnam. That is the cost associated with it. So you can see that it is really quite, quite, quite cheap compared to the other ones. So, so what are the different aspects in which we can do cost recovery? So in terms of cost recovery, there is two aspects that we are talking about. We're talking about direct cost and we're talking about indirect cost. So in terms of uh, direct cost, we have energy and resource savings. Uh, we have marketing and branding benefits, which are accrued, which you can actually be able, which are tangible, you can actually be able to get uh, benefits. Uh, we talk about proper values, that is in terms of green chemicals. Uh, if you're using green or sustainable chemicals, you are able to uh, actually uh, see uh, what they are, they are, they are, uh, they are, they are doing, um, what they are doing. Okay, so. Uh, just a minute, please. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. So, so we have direct cost and we have um, energy market, then you have property value, that is the green rating. If you are able to get government involvement and you are able to uh, have your building um, being uh, rated in terms of um, law um, uh, rating, then in, in, in terms of a direct benefit, you are able to get um, 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 uh, low interest rate on your house because of the fact that you're using uh, materials or using uh, chemicals that are user-friendly, sustainable in nature. Then of course we have um, countries that are well established whereby you can actually be able to get um, government incentives uh, on some of these um, 
uh, chemicals that you're using because so long as you're using uh, materials, for example, the ones that do not release CO2, then consequently, then you are, you are basically able to ask for carbon credits in a sense, uh, in terms of what you are, you, are, you are saving from just directly from your home. Then we have indirect costs that is waste reduction and, re uh, and recycling, where you can actually be able to recycle some of these chemicals or the waste that you're using. And so a could that, it could be direct cost, it could be direct cost, uh, depending on how you're looking at it. The, of course, in terms of directly, it's going to cost you more because you're going to be, um, have to retain this thing, keep them somewhere and what have you. But the, the indirect cost is because of the fact that it's going to help the environment. So that's, it's more of indirect. Then you have a sustainable and safer ecosystem. Like I said, that is the indirect uh, cost. Then of course, government incentives, which could be direct or indirect, depending on how you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are getting how involved you are. So what are energy and resource savings? Uh, we are talking about sustainable chemicals and material building. Uh, what we have is, uh, for example, if you're talking about the energy and resource, um, you are at the very beginning, you are able to um, invest a little bit higher cost in terms of the start for your sustainable material. But because of the fact that your materials are going to lead to uh, energy efficient systems, uh, you can see that the cost benefit analysis, the cost that you're going to be saving is quite long term. A cost that is for, for example, CO2 savings quite, could be very, very high. And, and so it's, it would be the same in terms of the water that you're using. It could be the same in terms of the energy you're consuming if you're using sustainable materials, sustainable systems, sustainable building. You are basically able to now uh, save a lot in terms of that, that those costs. So we are saying here that. Uh, sustainable chemical material building processes are designed to be more energy efficient and resource efficient, leading to reduced operational cost over the building lifespan. Remember at the very beginning when I was giving that um, sustainability chart, and I said that the energy efficiency, water efficiency, land efficiency, all those materials come into, um, into, in, 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 into, into play in terms of uh, what you're saving. Then we have using energy efficient lighting, insulation, uh, that is um, HVAC because once you've installed or you're using materials that are are, are what are, um, are sustainable in your in your in your house, um, consequently you find that your cost of power is going to go down, uh, cost of light is going to go down, your ventilation system cost is going to go down, uh, significant reduce energy consumption, and so you are able to save on that. So now the saving from reduce operational uh, operational cost can help offset the higher initial costs of sustainable material or sustainable chemicals in, in a sense, because we're talking about sustainable chemicals, which are materials, chemicals in, uh, in the materials uh, and processes. So you are able to save uh, from that. Then additionally, sustainable building practices such as rainwater harvesting leads to reduce cost in utility. That is just in terms of sustainability. Uh, Waste reduction, we're talking about sustainable chemical building practices, often prioritize waste reduction and recycling, which can result in cost saving. Because once you are, you are, you are using a sustainable um, process, even on the chemical aspect of it, you are able to recover costs because you are talking about prioritizing on waste uh, reduction, prioritizing on recycling, which results in greater savings in the, in the end. Then using recycled or salvage reclaimed material can lower material cost and reduce waste disposal. This one we're talking about, for example, when I was talking about polyurethane, and then you have the, the, sl the, 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 the blast furnace sl uh, slag. The slag is just a waste material. It's a, it's a salvageable material which you are reclaiming and you're now using it for what? For um, for sealants or for even waterproofing, and so you can pour for yeah for as 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 an uh, as as a, as a bonding material. So you are actually lowering cost in the end, and you can you could see that when when I did the cost comparison, you could see how great the difference. One was going for six thousand, the other one was going for about nine hundred. That that's a significant savings. Then implementing waste management plan and recycling programs during construction operation can use waste disposal. Yeah, this is important because we're talking about integrated management system. 
So when you are implementing stress management plans and recycling programs during construction, you can reduce waste disposal. And of course, that is in terms of the general outlay in terms of sustainability. Then um, if you are able to generate revenue from selling recycled materials, uh, that is very important because now you are able Uh, you're able to actually uh, see, um, uh, you're able to actually generate revenue from recycled materials basically. Because if you are able to generate, for example, now you're talking about demolition process, which is within the life cycle of the building. If you're able to uh, sell off some of those materials as recyclable materials, you're able to generate materials. And those, all these things are chemicals. If you can be able to capture them, uh, um, uh, call them for some certain time, sell them, then you are um, you are actually leading to better um, better results, basically. So marketing and branding benefits. Now, one of the things that we know is that if you are living in a sustainable building, you stand a higher chance uh, of getting, or um, if you are ever selling your house, uh, to get very good price. So this is the marketing strategy where you can actually be able to say that, okay, my house is made out of sustainable chemicals and materials uh, and processes, um, which now uh, you can actually accrue direct cost in terms of what these things can be able to bring. Then you have consumer investors um, uh, investors who are interested. If, for example, you wanted to build a whole estate and you are perspective is that I want to use sustainable chemicals, I want to use sustainable materials, you will get investors um, interested. And so that means that you actually have a bigger pool in terms of if you are a con 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 constructor, contractor who does sustainable building. Then you have increased economic activity for businesses. If you are able to, for example, if you're making a building, uh, um, a supermarket or even a small shopping center, you are able to say that this this is the first sustainable material, sustainable sustainably built um, material. You are able now to pull in um, those kind of uh, marketing and branding benefits that are come um, from that. Then you have calls for government incentives, whereby now as the benefit of green buildings continue to change the architectural, engineering, construction industry, and the number of green projects rise, um, uh, which is due to market change where more construction from get, get involved. Um, uh, uh, and of course, new buildings come in and then there's going, also going to be more and better expectation for new hires from uh, very, very skilled um, individuals. So what happens in, in return when you have all the skilled workforce and all of the government gets involved because they want to now uh, give incentives in terms of, okay, we want to uh, promote this particular sector. And so you see that so many government offer incentives to promote the use of sustainable building material and process for tax credits, grants and subsidy, because of course materials are much better. Uh, in conclusion, so the concrete uh, uh, industry must face the environmental issues linked to them, manufacturing by increasing the energy efficiency and adopting alternative fuel or raw materials. Um, secondly, as the benefits of green building continue to change the architectural, engineering, construction industry and the number of green projects rises due to market changes, more sustainable chemicals are going to be used and more um, to be used. This would lead to better research on methods and use of sustainable chemicals in construction industry. This will eventually lead to lower initial costs due to the availability of the material, skilled workers, um, and efficient construction. Uh, then many government offer incentives to promote use of building, um, green building, um, or green or chem green chem sustainable chemicals. Uh, or processes, for example, tax credit, grants, and subsidies. Uh, thank you. So I um, I don't know if Enoch, you can hear me. Yes. yes. Yeah, uh, Cecilia is gone. I don't know if she's uh, she's lost power or something because I cannot communicate to her. I can see that she has. Uh, I'm here. Has... Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, you can hear. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you're still running. Oh, I end up now disappear. Okay, maybe I'm the one who's not seeing this thing directly. 
Okay, so um, uh, what, what I was trying to show is that. Thank you very much for that summary. And I, and I have uh, slides I'll ask you to go back on, but I wanted, Anna, Anna, do you have any comments or additional information you wanted to add? I see your mic moving, but can't hear you. Uh, he's asking, he, he could not hear you correctly. So, Hezron, uh, if you can go back to the one on, I'll, I'll take, I will, I'll go back on the slides. If you can go back to the one on marketing benefits. And it's dimming. Uh, we have this, and it seems like Zoom has a new feature um, to prevent epilepsy, but it randomly dims screens. If you could um, make the screen uh, bright again, because I can barely see. Is it any clear? It's still it's still dimmed out. I don't know. Anyway, well, the, the point um, here, just to contextualize this, uh, it's sometimes people say, what do you mean by the fact that uh, people pay more for the building? And it's not just because somebody goes out and says uh, a green building is better, that people are willing to pay more. It's not about gullibility. You have what happens is when people are in buildings, uh, volatile organic compounds that Hezron mentioned at the beginning is one, you don't see them. So you're in a building, you'll never see this with the naked eye, uh, even with some infrared spectrum, you probably won't see them, but you'll feel it in terms of you'll notice that when you're at work, uh, by the time noon reaches, you always have a headache or you're at work and you start, uh, by the time uh, four o'clock reaches, you feel like you're so sleepy and you're so exhausted and you have no energy, but then you get out of, uh, of work and within an hour you feel energized. Typically that is happening because uh, you've been uh, breathing in some kind of volatile organic compound vapor and you're actually, they call it sick building syndrome. Uh, and then you go into a building that has been well designed and people have taken care to make sure that you don't have uh, these types of uh, daily chemical exposure. And you know, you're like, I don't know what it is. I, I love being in this building. I love being in this space. Same thing with natural lighting. Uh, some, you know, natural lighting is healthier for the eyes. It's healthier for the sight. So when you're in buildings that have a lot of artificial lighting, you'll start wondering, do I need to, I mean, I wear glasses because that's, uh, I've been myopic for, for since childhood, but um, you find people who have regular eyesight and they're in buildings with artificial lighting and they start wondering, do I need to go see a doctor? Do I need to go get a prescription? My eyes are bothering me all the time, but you change that to natural lighting and those problems start to go away. So these are the, the benefits that people start to notice uh, slowly by slowly. And once uh, more, it's hard to say when, uh, when there are not a lot of these green buildings and people haven't had a chance to experience them, uh, there, it's hard for people to imagine why it is that anybody would prefer that green building. But once you get into a green building space, uh, most of the reactions are like, oh my God, I want this. I want this. Uh, why, why, why isn't it that my building doesn't look like this or it doesn't feel like this? And then if we could go back to the one on the LCA, because that had some interesting, I'm just going backwards so people have a this one or yes. this, one? this uh, one? This one. So we're looking at um, the whole building life cycle and uh, we went into a sort of the chemicals and what we want you to do is think of chemicals. So 
easiest way to take this out of a very abstract reference for those of you who feel like when you hear about chemistry, you're going to pass out. Uh, think of a cake. When you're making a cake, that is a high uh, uh, coordinated chemical process. You don't think of it that way, but it is. The flour or the unga, as we say, that's the cement. Uh, that, the mixture, and then you're going to try and turn that cement into banana bread, into uh, a white cake, uh, all those different things. That's the same thing that we're doing when we mix up a concrete and cement in a building. Uh, one would be you want to do, to do it for the flooring, the walls, the this, the different structures and the different output and looks and the tint all of those things are just like how you add different ingredients to a cake. When you add sugar, that's a binding material. Same thing chemically happens when you're adding, uh, you saw uh, uh, Hezron mentioning some of the chemicals that, that, that you, you, if they have sort of high levels of, um, uh, not silicate, but, um, sorry. The, the, the help me. It's not carbs. <laughs> the um, the polymeric materials, which uh, sorry, you we can't we can't hear you. Yeah, I was saying that most of them are actually polymeric materials, um, which 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 are based on. I still on, can't on hear you. Okay, let me see. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. you. No, nope. we lost you on sound. That's weird. Can you hear me, Cecilia? Cecilia? I think Cecilia is... Uh... Uh, sound has a problem. Yeah, I think she she's uh, because uh, I can actually. Uh, so it, like it's like a a, a glucose, but in 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 the, the chemical name I'm looking for that I'm having trouble remembering. No, that, but the, it, the, it, the, it, the, it's the a binding effect. Where the sugars create this kind of bonding effect, and those materials then like when. Okay. The cellulose, thank you, Hezron. The, the cellulose um, uh, components, uh, basically when you're looking at uh, plant materials and soys and all of those, um, you don't think of all that as sugars, but they are sugars. So when you add those plant-based materials, like uh, Hezron was making, mentioning about the alternative substitutes, uh, the reason that they, be, they form binders is because of the cellulose in the, the, the organic matter that then is like a sugar that holds the cake together. And then if we can go to the slide where you had um, the metric tons, I think that was really interesting. This one? Yes. And uh, so you can see here that in terms of what he was saying, mold uh, to prevent mold and uh, uh, to making sure in terms of how the form of the, 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 the building material works. Um, and what I really liked about this is uh, a lot of times we hear that um, the cost of green construction is significantly higher, 30% higher, sometimes 50% higher. But what we're showing here is when it comes to the chemicals themselves, you can get very affordable chemical substitutes. Uh, uh, and you can save on, so that's the, the most basic level of how it is that you, the raw materials that you have in a building. You can see a difference between uh, 2,980 per ton to 900, uh, even at the max end, 1,000 per ton, you're still at less than half 
of what you'd be on the low end uh, when you're looking at forming your lease agents. So the question then comes up, people would say, if, if the chemicals are cheaper, which they obviously probably the mindset is that they're not, but if you're showing us that the chemicals are cheaper, why is it that then you have a more expensive building material? Uh, number one, you have manufacturing systems that need to be changed. So the machines that work with uh, traditional, uh, probably you need newer machines, you need a different type of equipment in terms of to produce that kind. So that change of equipment cost then has a ripple effect into the, you, you need sort of initially an, uh, like solar panels. In the beginning, you remember solar panels were extremely, extremely expensive. The more solar panels have been sold, the more uh, p uh, production, it's called the cost production uh, curve. Uh, we now start having a, a lowering of the cost to the end user because we have more of those sol solar panels in terms of production mechanisms and skills and the manufacturing processes and equipment that are there. So that's part of it. The other is looking at uh, what people don't realize is there's a lot of legal aspects that go uh, associated with uh, a building. And when people are looking at uh, the insurance risk or the financial risk and all of that, when they don't know a process, they tend to say, oh, then it has to be riskier. So it takes time to show over that the benefits outweigh the risk. But in the meantime, you have uh, legal and financial costs in terms of risk premiums that are also driving up the cost in terms of looking at things from the construction, construction perspective. So some that, all this to say that it's not always the cost of the material that's driving up the cost of the green building, it's the uncertainty or the risk premiums associated with that. And the reason for creating forums like this is so that we begin to have discussions, whether you're a chemist or not a chemist about what, how would you look at this? If you're sitting in a bank and somebody's telling you, uh, it comes across and somebody has put in their pro forma that I use vegetable milk uh, oils instead of jute polyurethane uh, in terms of a sealer, probably your underwriter is going to say, is that KEBS approved? And if it's KEBS approved, uh, then the next question will be, okay, what, what is the um, actuarial risk table for the building degradation on uh, ester oils instead of using a polyurethane sealer. So those are the kind of decisions. And there's simulation techniques to be able to do that. Of course, everybody prefers um, out of sight of the simulation to have actual uh, weather tested buildings that have been built out, outside of the laboratory where they can test it. And that's where the piloting of these buildings becomes really important so that we can actually not just have what the model says, but we can have the physical structure and people can observe and measure over time. And in a lot of Western countries, that process has started. Here in Kenya, uh, uh, thanks to organizations like Kenya Green Building Society and others, we're starting that journey, but we don't have a lot of local data. Uh, I know the National Construction Authority is also beginning to create create some buildings on their pilot testing sites to be able to analyze some of these things. But we're gathering that data. But the more people get involved in this, uh, the better that we'll be able to gather uh, the performance data uh, and really be able to uh, get some of these uh, cost efficiency and cost recovery measures uh, clarified with local uh, actual local case studies instead of just looking to foreign case studies. Um, I don't know uh, if you or Anna had anything to add to that. To, to, to first of all uh, say that the, the presentation is really good and uh, sustainable building material is the way to go now. When we look at uh, the cost of uh, sustainable material and the benefit of the benefits of steps the cost 
look, for example, we are just looking at uh, the, the returns, the return on investment on what you have done, so that uh, so that you can be able to say that now sustainable building material is expensive than the other one. But we forget on the the comfort and the health, uh, the indirect benefit that we get. For example, the health when you use the sustainable building material, you are assured of your health because you spend most of the time in the house and therefore your health will be improved using the sustainable building material. And that cost of treating certain diseases when they enter to the body is reduced completely. And that cost, if we in return go, goes back to the the, the 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 benefits that you get when you use sustainable uh, building material you get that sustainable building material are, are way far cheaper than the 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 the, the unsustainable building material so uh, sustainable ma building material i want us to look on the benefits on the indirect benefits are more than the direct benefits of using the sustainable building material. That's what I would like to add. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is very true. Um, the the, the long-term effect of using sustainable uh, chemicals or materials uh, will, of course, out, outweigh um, any initial cost uh, um, uh, fears that, 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 that may arise. Uh, some of the things that, because Cecilia had mentioned quite, quite uh, had mentioned all, all, most of the parameters that leads towards um, th that high initial cost. Um, the, apart from the fact that the industry, there's the industry standards, which, which, which is the building codes, the laws that are associated with buildings and all of you, before the, the buildings that you're allowed to sit in, the engineers have to approve and all those sorts of things. Apart from that, there's also the aspects of where the, the, the green chemicals are manufactured. Um, some of them are not really that easy to get. So that, that means that now if you're not going to be able to get it, or despite the fact that they are cheaper, because of the availability, because for example, like the one that I said, uh, that goes for about between 40 to 120 dollars, um, that one you can only get it in Vietnam. So you can imagine if you are, the, the, the cost of the replacement is about 6,000. Uh, 6,200 um, for 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 the for the synthetic material that you're using, whereas the one you can get it for forty dollars in Vietnam. So you can imagine if you're going to build a whole estate, carrying a whole tanker of 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 vegetable oil from Vietnam, let me say for example to Kenya or even to America, um, the, 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 it becomes more expensive because of the availability. Whereas the initial cost, if the material was available in or at around where you're building, then the cost would be um, compressively reduced. But those are the, 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 the challenges that the fact that, despite the fact that they're increasing, the, the, the use of sustainable chemicals and materials are increasing, it is still not yet up to the level. So what we need to do is to improve on that, improve on, that, on, on the communication, improve in terms of uh, educating the public, in terms of what they need to do so that now, when the, the industry standard becomes the sustainable chemistry uh, materials, then now you can actually see the, the, the entire benefit to the whole ecosystem. Uh, but they're from uh, Vietnam. Uh, is it possible, like, is the level of difficulty in terms of uh, making those materials here? Because with green building, you're supposed to, as much as possible, not just source locally, but source as close to the site as possible, because transportation adds uh, emissions to the process and you're trying to reduce that. Um, are, are those processes, uh, processes that would be easy to develop here or difficult? I would like to say that uh, in most, that's an example that he was giving, but in most cases, every construction material in a given area, they have sustainable building material within that area. If you are building in Kenya, we have a sustainable 
building material within that country that you can be able to utilize. And that way you'll be able to, to, to reduce the costs of, 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 of construction of that, buying that sustainable building material. So you will not be able to incur more costs in transportation and importation costs and all those duties. For government incentive, what we're really saying is it doesn't necessarily have to be a financial incentive, but um, maybe a regulatory incentive uh, that uh, encourages uh, the local um, manufacturers, entrepreneurs, innovators to be able to look for this information in terms of the sustainable ingredients and chemicals and then see what because they you know if we, we know our country or our resources best to be able to find what is it that we could do that's closest or similar or even better sometimes than what we know is now used in uh, uh, in in terms of the international best practice benchmark is what i'm hearing in terms of incentives for and this could be not just national government incentives it could be county level incentives because now we have um uh, countries can develop different bylaws in terms of how they they do the materials um another thing i wanted to uh, just clarify when uh, and i've talked about the the health cost uh, let's take a simple look uh, in terms of asthma you're in a building where you're exposed to volatile organic compounds and you think you know you're, you're having breathing trouble and you have an inhaler so let's say your inhaler costs you about 5,000 Kenya shillings per month, and then you have to go to the doctor maybe every uh, two or three months to get the prescription bill. That's another uh, 3,000. So you start adding up those costs, not and and also your lower productivity because when you're you're having trouble breathing, you work slower, you think slower, you're not as you're not the super employee that you uh, are that when you're in a healthy building environment. So you also look at um, reduced work time productivity because you're not feeling good. So when you start looking at that, the cost out of your pocket of medical treatment, plus uh, uh, the cost uh, in terms of, I'm, I'm gonna stay away from whether it's costing the employer, it's just you as an employee might take two or three times longer to do the same amount of job work than you would if you were feeling healthy. So it's not just a cost to the employee, it's just a strain on your system. So those are the kind of things that we're saying. Uh, there are ways of, of measuring that. It's not that it's, it's mysterious. Uh, it's just it takes time to develop the studies that directly link that to a particular chemical or a particular building or a particular issue uh, in terms of scientific proof. Uh, what, so some people are saying, while that scientific uh, causality evidence builds up, can we just test and see if we take out all the stuff that we know is bad, do we feel better? Because uh, sometimes if you, uh, you know, it's like uh, if somebody were to tell you stop drinking uh, petrol, and you say, why would I drink petrol? Petrol is not something, it's not, it's not juice. Why would I drink it? So this is the same kind of concept. There are some of these things that are in the buildings in terms of chemicals that would be, in terms of logic, it would be the same as you trying to drink petrol. You, you don't do that. So they will say, if you know we don't do that, then why is it there in the first place? Let's just get rid of it. So that, that's the premise behind some of these chemical substitutions that we're looking for in buildings. Anything else we want to cover before we end this session? So we also want to put on record on um, uh, May 25th, we have a special session where we'll be collaborating. We have our partners, International Sustainable Collaborative Center. Uh, they're an arm, chemical unit arm of GIZ in Germany. And uh, this month and ongoing, you can check the ISCP website for the Sustainable Chemistry Spotlight on May 25th. Uh, Kennedy Olale, who you've seen here before, 
will be presenting at the ISCP Sustainable Chemistry Spotlight, and he'll be talking about uh, polyfluorinated carb uh, carbon PFCs and PFAs, uh, which are typically found in waterproofing materials and why we need to remove those. That uh, discussion will be a little more on the chemistry side, but if you're curious about what, what the chemistry discussion sounds like, uh, we more than welcome you to join, even if you're not a chemist. Uh, sometimes just um, it's like hearing a new language. Uh, you don't, if you go to Italy and you don't speak Italian, you it might sound very confusing at first, but eventually you hear the words enough and you're like, ah, that one manja means I need to eat. Uh, yes, I'll eat. So uh, you over time, uh, some of these, um, you know, volatile organic compound, that's one that people seem to pick up very easily. You don't need to know all the more, uh, chemi chemicals that are VOCs, but when you hear on a C on a label that this is a VOC, this is a volatile organic compound, you'll say, wait a minute, no, I don't want to be breathing that. And that's our goal, just to expose you to the language, expose you to the nomenclature so it gets easier for you to recognize. And if you're a chemist, of course, go deeper into the knowledge on what this is about. And with that, we thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Bye.